faster than ever Boyle Sports app. Multiples made easy and personalised content on every sport. Download it now. Boyle Sports. Time to play. I'm prepared to end it I can. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Julian Lopetegui is the uh, new... I don't know why I did that with an Italian accent, given that he's that Spanish. Was, that was a very strange show. Yeah. Julian Lopetegui, the Spanish manager over the last two years, unbeaten across 40 matches. They've won 26 of them, is the new Real Madrid manager. This came through about 25 minutes before we spoke to Graham Hunter earlier today, mm. and there was general shell shock. He wasn't even in the, like, the top 60 you know, betting options, I think, on odds checker or something like that. And yeah. like a lot of these modern manager markets, unfortunately, have been, like, tainted by betting and stuff. And it's generally, there's no sense of surprise. Like, it's a long time where we've had, like, a big reveal of a manager. It's like, here we go. It's like the old school way of finding out news. I know. Well, Madrid have given us two. Zidane leaving took us all by surprise. And now Lopetegui is joining after the World Cup. And it seems that it's come as a complete surprise to everybody around the camp. Even the Spanish FA, who were presuming that he was very much their guy for the next World Cup cycle for sure, and maybe beyond, maybe he was the next yeah. eight years. They were planning on him being the perfect fella. He'd brought all these players through. He was with the under-19s, 20s, 21s teams, won the under-19 championship in 2012 and the under-21 championship in 2013. Didn't do amazingly well at Porto for two years, but then has gone in as Spanish manager and uh, played 20, won 14, drawn six in his uh, two years and uh, complete shock. All the players, nobody knew anything about it. So Graham Hunter will join us from Russia. Their first match is in Sochi against Portugal this Friday. That is on the way. Uh, there's a few bits and bobs going around. Just a quick thing to mention was this Raheem Sterling interview. Did you see this? I saw I saw some uh, selection of his comments. This stuff, but not wanting to leave just, the house. Um, just the general harshness of being Raheem Sterling where everything you do is criticised. So he talked about even a couple of years ago playing in one of the Euro matches and feeling he did very well and he beat his man a few times and he got some good balls in and then he just was shocked, like he got genuinely surprised afterwards to see that everybody was, to use his phrase, caning him. Mm. Uh, the media fans were just saying, oh, he's crap. And he was like, oh my God, this is, like I know I wasn't, I did all right here. And then he's just talking about life is Raheem Sterling and he says I'm constantly thinking of something bad will happen and so he's talking about just his day to day life here I don't even think I'm going out tonight to eat some food because if I go out tonight something bad is going to happen is that mm. this certainty that something will take a turn anything that happens my mum is always on the phone she's the one that's stronger than me it's quite a revealing vulnerable line for him to uh, give she's the one that's stronger than me she'll tell me how to get through it she will say not to pay any attention but there's been times when she's close to breaking. Until football is finished, I'll try and stay at my house as much as I can. I'll watch TV, then no one can say anything. Yeah, it's grim. I mean, it is a sort of extraordinary oh, that, that it's not extraordinary, but it, it, it's part of a, of a, not to be very cynical about it, but a strategy in some way that like Southgate, Gareth Southgate seems to have encouraged his players to be open and to speak. Mm. And I think like this is a bad story, but I think it's also playing out well for them. That I think, you know, we've had Danny Rose speaking about issues, we've had, you know, Sterling opening up, and we're sort of getting to learn more about these English players in such a way that I think, I think even how it's been interpreted in their parish as such, I think people are sort of warming to them a small bit. The stiff of her lip is uh, dead and gone. Yeah, it's, it is It is remarkable now, really, they could, they could, you know, huff and puff against Tunisia next Monday and it'll all be deemed irrelevant. Mm. But I think they're getting a lot of the preparation right. Okay, and that's a cynical way of looking at this being part of a plan. Like that's not, you know, studying this in isolation. And in isolation, it's horrendous that this yeah. is what, you know, that Sterling has somehow become, uh, Sterling just seems to have become a target. And it's been well discussed, you know, here in recent weeks, you know, that, that this particular point that, like, why him? Mm. You know, and it, it feels like it should be part of some kind of, you know, study or thesis on Raheem Sterling's treatment. And why why has why has this come to pass? Yeah. Um, but it is unusual. It's the kind of thing. You know, this is the, these are the kind of quotes and comments that sort of come out when someone's doing a book at their end of their career. Know. You know, rather yeah. than when they're sort of, in his case, barely halfway through it. Well, that um, Danny Rose did the most revealing interview you'll see a footballer do maybe every five years, something like that comes about. And he just did it in that big warehouse where all the players are thrown out in front of the media. It's not an exclusive, it's not a one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't stage managed by any kind of agents. It was just like, uh, 
Danny Rose is talking now and it seems like the crowd got bigger as they realised what he was talking mm. about. Um, very striking. I saw a piece on the, um, the U London Times as well about just the English base. It's a four-star hotel. It's quite nice. It's a good bit outside of Moscow because Southgate found the traffic there appalling when he was there for the Confederations Cup. And the facilities are amazing. They built, they, they, they built a pool. Moscow. I think you're in St. Petersburg, I think, is it? Sorry, it might I think be St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, it's all Russia yeah, over there. It's, over it's there. all, you know, Russia. There's even Drago and various other people all there. I, yeah, think, yeah. I think they're next door to Drago. I don't know, though. Yeah. Um, but they're outside the city. They built a swimming pool. They brought their own chef. They all have their own room. But there are no curfews. There's no social media ban. They all wanted ITV to watch Love Island. That was the other thing. That was a key, a key nugget of information. Can we get Love Island in here? This is this is like this could be the key. You know, this is this is the the breaking point. You know, where did it all go wrong? Love yeah. Island wrapped up it's a, a week before the World Cup. That last week was torture for them. They had nothing to watch. Yeah, but I mean, they they've got it so badly wrong in recent years, and they've tried everything. Whereas like oh six, weren't they central? Um, and then there, you know, there was the antics of the wags that I was were just going to say oh six was peak wags. Two thousand and ten, they went for isolation in South Africa, and everyone was bored. And there was like a combination of that and Capello's yeah. rigorous regime, which was yeah. like a bad combination. The only way you could have cancelled out Capello's uh, sort of overly studious way was to maybe put them somewhere a bit livelier. Uh, and they didn't even have that release. There was they no Love Island in 2010 there was no either. Love, what did they even have, you know? Uh, and 2014 really... I mean, you don't really hear too much really about 2014 that it was like some kind of logistical disaster. They no. just got beaten. They weren't there very long. No, they weren't there that long and they, they lost narrowly two games. Yeah. Um, there's, no, there's no great scandal in that. But yeah. they've, they've tried a bit of everything and Zegade's gone for this approach. Well, it um, seems the last time they really had a good time I, like, was in 96 when... It must be said they didn't leave the country, uh, which maybe contributed. Possibly helped. <laughs> didn't have to worry about getting in Love Island or no. whatever the word or whatever they were watching at the time. Families are allowed to visit the day after matches. As I said, no social media bans. There's no curfew, interestingly. Mm. You can go do what you want. Um, so, anyway, that's kind of the general the vibe. Upon us, the, yeah. the Raheem Sterling uh, interview is worth checking out. It's uh, really quite extraordinary. And it's the biggest cliche in the world to say you forget these guys are human, yada, yada, yada. But I mean, geez, like. Like Sterling is almost like a media creation. He's like the character that he is in the media isn't real the way they talk about mm. him. And you forget, like, here is a guy in his early 20s who's basically bringing his mum freaked out because it seems, it must seem to him like the whole world hates him. And he is basically a recluse. Yeah. He has to live his life not going even out for some pasta at seven o'clock because, in his own paranoid mind, like, how paranoid is this? Something bad will happen. Yeah. That's not a hell, like, he should actually talk to someone. Something bad will happen. Imagine walking around thinking that. Yeah, it's just a constant sense of foreboding. It's no way to live. Dan, it's 30 years since Ray Hatton did his uh, little thing in Stuttgart. Yeah. You may have heard we did a little road show I recently. Did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, 30 years ago. The Irish Independent are celebrating this, and we did our road show last Thursday. We were very happy about it as well. Moreland will take the free kick. And right. And Stevens together. Galvin pulling it across. A missed kick by Sansom, in goes Aldridge, and Houghton! 1-0! And Ray Houghton has stopped the breakthrough! It's so unusual for me to score with like, anything, uh, and especially in my head, I was so pleased, it was just fantastic. Well, Packy, as you've seen yourself, was brilliant in goal, the defence was great, and overall I think he probably deserved it in the end. Obviously before we thought we could do it, you know, and now it's come through, but... Uh, that's the hardest 90 minutes you've come across. I did ask earlier before we came on if there was any story that we hadn't heard about Euro 88 over the last 30 years. You're a bit like the Rolling Stones at this stage. The hits come out <laughs> on a regular basis when you're doing these type of nights. And Ronnie, you have one story, you reckon, that hasn't been spoken about too many times. Um, no, when we, when we uh, got back from Germany, we back right, into... I'm off now. <laughs> <laughs> We were back into Dublin, there was the Tour de City. So we were drinking all around the Tour de City and um, everybody was, had had a lot of drink. And we got back to the hotel. We, myself, Ray and Aldo were on a nine, 10 o'clock flight or whatever it was. So we decided in our wisdom that we would phone up the wives and say, we, we can't get back out, there's a big dinner. So three of us went up to the room, phoned the wives and we're back down in 10 minutes with our bags ready <laughs> to go because the wives said, get yourselves home. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we, we had a few more pints in the airport and we eventually got on the plane and we were like second row from the front. So we, we take off and we're only five minutes into the air and Ray goes, I need a toilet. He said, I've got to go to the toilet. I said, Ray, the light's on, you can't go. And he, he just was adamant and he's climbing over me, right? So he, and he climbs over me and he gets up out of his chair and the toilet is there. So I'm thinking he's going to go to the toilet and he takes one step towards the toilet and then he turns around and there's the whole plane is packed. And he looks down the plane and he goes, who put the ball in the English <laughs> <laughs> That's the last on Thursday with Nathan uh, Murphy, reliving the good times, which the Irish Independent have decided to do today in novel fashion. So essentially, the Indo has reprinted the paper as it appeared. The well, yeah, day. they've eight of the pages from the day after, actually. It was like June the 13th, but it's the, the big match coverage and reaction afterwards. So, uh, I mean, there's sort of some great stuff in there, sort of for, ranging from just the general news stories and match coverage to, like, the TV listings of the day and stuff like that. I mean, there is plenty of... It's still... People can still sort of get out there and have a, have a look at it, but it's... Uh, Give me the TV listings. The TV listings are, are particularly special. The one thing that struck me, aside from the fact that the... What um, time does TV start in 1988? TV would have started... Well, RT one it, it only started in the afternoon, of course. What, what time? Ten past four. In the afternoon? Yeah, and <laughs> I think uh, RT 2 was a bit later. The, the, the British channels, I think, were like 6am or, you know, a couple of them. In 88, uh, RT started at four o'clock in the afternoon. Sorry. Is that what, 4 p.m. Well, RTE started? 10 past 4, Emmerdale Farm, followed by Bosco. That's what I'm working off here. Okay, what's that? Uh, RTE 2 had a repeat of the Sunday game kicking off at 25 to 6. Oh, I like that. The, the one thing that's what day was this, by the way? This was a Monday. This and they repeat Monday. the Sunday game. They nice. repeat the Sunday for people who'd been. So you don't need it now with demand. Well, this is the thing. The other, I mean, TV also finished early, but what struck me, of what course... What time? This was during, well, midnight on most channels. I think, yeah, I mean, RTE was done with late news at 11.20, and we got RTE 2. We had uh, the end of tr transmission was 11.50 p.m. with uh, a bit of Shirley Bassey era before that. Um, God, you've just brought back a vivid memory. Not Shirley Bassey, but like being a kid in that period. So I was four in 88. It mustn't have changed much because I can sort of remember getting up in the middle of the night feeling sick, you know, downstairs with your dad, here's some Calpol or whatever, yeah. and turning on the TV and just seeing like the, diff the different colours. on The, the transmission thing transmission or whatever, screen, yeah, yeah. And just like thinking, ugh. Oh, What's going on here? Well, I knew what was going on, but just I, I just it's suddenly come back to me. It's there. What was the half nine uh, feed? Half what half was after news? On well, Monday? the one thing that strikes me first of all, there was no football on any of the channels. Like a major tournament was ongoing, but there was it was only an eight team tournament. So it was obviously like rest day the oh, day yeah. after. But there was no like uh, you know highlights program, nothing on to get your football fix if you wanted to see what went on. So uh, like RT one, you had the news at nine o'clock. You had Miami Vice afterwards. No, got a good hour of Miami right. Vice in some movie and a BBC to be Panorama, Northern Ireland, The Long Peace, Peter Taylor assessing the impact of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, of course, like... Three years earlier. Yeah, well, and at the height of the, the troubles in many respects. And then, yeah, Coronation Street, you got a bit of Brookside there on Channel 4, some average movies. Um, but, uh, yeah, complete absence of sport yeah. on TV. Look, it was a dark time. Uh, Sunday no, Game was the no only sporting programme I think I can find on any of the, the six channels. There's no dressing so, up um, the fact that it was grim for people back then. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, they're probably talking to each other, you know, as Ugh. opposed to... Yeah, that's the worst. They're out talking and... Small talk and eye contact and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't want that. They actually watch games on TV as opposed to on their phones, you I, know? I don't make eye contact with people anymore. It's I'm, it's going. You just... That's gone. Bar in here. Other than that, I don't just, really like doing it. Netflix instead, yeah. So, um... Match coverage. There was player ratings Yeah, go well. on. Give us, the, give us the match coverage then. Because like, I, I actually am familiar that Mick McCarthy was given a 6 out of 10 controversially, and I believe it was a sticking point between him and... I think it was Carl McGinty who did the ratings for uh, years afterwards. Carl but, uh, McGinty of golf? Fame. Yeah, he well, Carl would have been a sports editor in the end yeah. for a time and covered football for a number of years as well. Okay. So McCarthy got a six. Some good quotes, Ray Houghton's quotes. Sometimes the quotes of that era were um, slightly unusual quotes that you couldn't imagine people saying them out loud as much now. A lot of like exclamation marks and sort of quips and comments like Ray Houghton the day after but England are still good enough to win their next two games they have class players wouldn't it be nice if both of us could go through exclamation mark unlikely if, I mean 
was that the sentiment at the time? Maybe that's how the Irish dressing room felt. Maybe that was just Ray. Mm. Um, but Jack Charlton talking about the Irish fan, they'll drink the place dry tonight, but I guarantee they won't fight. The Irish are the best in the world for parties. Wow. Again, exclamation mark. So this is like the the uh, the, the big match quotes. And uh, there's a Kevin Moran column. He was, uh, he like was obviously diary. doing a diary at the time. Okay. Sort of speaking about, you know, we said all along we weren't just coming out here to make up the numbers. And now that we've beaten one of the favourites, the sky's the limit. One down and two to go. That's not bad. And I wonder what the bookies make of our chances now. I'm not a betting man, but I guess we're not 33 to 1 shots to win the tournament any longer. So that was the Kevin Moran thing. And yeah, there's lots of other interesting stuff. Pictures, a little graphic of the goal. Um, and yeah, quotes from Jack Charlton, Bobby Robson. Um, and player ratings were, you know, McGinty's a sort of a tough taskmaster. Yeah, go a, on. Give us, the, give us everyone. Thank you, Bonner got a nine. That was, that was did well. Chris Morris, a seven. Polished, confident, assured. Okay. Uh, Kevin Moran, an eight. Mick McCarthy, a six. Again. What did he say? Is there a few lines under Mick? Usually the rock of the Irish rearguard, Mick was a little exposed for pace when the English floated <laughs> the ball over the top. Doubts had been expressed about the Celtic players' fitness before the game, and he was not at his sharp. Oh! You kind of wonder why Mick like, adopted maybe a siege mentality <laughs> from an early, an early stage. Uh, Chris Hewton with a seven. Dependable. Ray, Dependable. Ray, oh, Ray Houghton got a 10. Sorry. I, I, 10? I, I've, I've completely contradicted myself. I I've never seen one. anyone get a 10 before. Gone for the extremes. Well, there you go. He, he got the 10. Ronnie Whelan with a 9. Yeah. What does it say about Whelan? Blasting one shot off the crossbar was the highlight of an excellent display by Whelan, whose vision, ball control and passing were a joy to behold. Like his Liverpool team club mate Houghton, Ronnie is a tireless performer who also contributes much defensively. We forget how good Whelan was. Yeah, he was exceptionally good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Paul McGrath with a 7. Tony Galvin with a 7, Frank Stapleton with an 8, and uh, John Aldridge with a 9. But there's other stuff as well, I think, like the news uh, reporter... What does it say about Aldridge? Aldridge, still no goals for Anfield striker John, but with a performance like this, who cares? <laughs> Aldridge mercilessly handed the English defence right across the width of the pitch, chasing lost causes and goal chances with enthusiasm and energy. Nice. So, uh, yeah, there's a, like, there's a news piece as well with uh, Frank, someone went to watch the game with Frank Stapleton's parents, you know, the old, they throw open the family home for yeah. one player and they went there and then just various news reports of, uh, like, p the papers would have been produced obviously very differently in those days, it would have been over the phone, like, there's clearly stuff from the pre-match atmosphere that sort of is a separate piece. Well, it wasn't added to or changed later in the day. There's like a Philip Quinn thing. You obviously watched it in some pub then in Wexford and uh, it was like detailing the atmosphere in the pub at the time. Uh, and there's a bit of a TV review as well, uh, like a TV viewer of John Giles and Don Givens oh. were a panel that day. Well, well give me, I, I love a good TV review. What's TV the, review, I'm kind of trying to bust that this, up now. This is basically, is this Giles' first tournament? Or yeah. did he do 86? He's, um. He just told Nathan the other Thursday. It's yeah. close enough. I think he did 86 and 88 was his first year. Low-key commentary was a very pleasant change. It was Tom O'D was the, the, the view. The RTE team of commentators, experts, Bill O'Hare, he called them, like the Irish soccer team, is drawn from a limited choice of talent of which the very best use is made. Uh, like the guys in the field, they played it straight with no flourishes as they always do on those occasions. So... There seemed to be a little catch in Bill O'Herlity's voice when the coverage was handed back to the studio at the end of the match, and why not? And then just discusses Giles, um, you know, Giles and Don Givens and keeping their relation in control, and they were very measured, apparently. I actually did, someone gave me the TV coverage a couple of years back, I don't know if I spoke about this on here, but the TV coverage of the 1988 game, the full thing. Yeah. It was like a DVD, they, they, they'd got it sort of, you know, cut onto a CD or whatever. And it was great, you know, like there was Giles and, and Givens in the studio, but there was also like a pre-match package with the heroes of Goodison Park. I think it was 19, it 1949 or 50 where Ireland beat England. Yeah. Famous game. And like, the guys were all alive at the time. And it was a very much, you know, retrospective piece with them in their sort of, you know, they were sort of senior citizens almost at that point and, and going through it. So... It's a moment in time. I mean, nostalgia isn't everyone's cup of tea, but mm. like, I love this stuff, I have to say, particularly because we are in a, such a different world now. And uh, yeah, I think, the TV I, I think, listings I think is including the, the TV listings was, was, was a genius. Touch of genius. I'm biased, but I mean, I think that was a. No, the TV I, listings is made. I sort of spent a good bit of time just looking at that today, which maybe isn't the point of the whole thing. Um, mm. I haven't quite got to the bridge or the crossword yet, but um, yeah, it's, uh, there was a sport channel on, like, remember there was like the old Sky. Satellite. I think if if you had like the the version of NTL, the the precursor of NTL, which like was the Super Channel, was there and stuff like that, and there was a sports channel, uh, but it had a limited choice, 
you have the golf, USPJ, and then some global wrestling and Major League Baseball. But I don't very remember. Different times. Yeah, I don't remember. I think if you in the cities, like you would have, um, there would have been some like local cable television available but it was a sort of a limited choice of channels anyway say a super channel or something like that it's a relatively uh, when you think about it we've got about a minute here i was just going to say there's no other big stories that we must talk about from a world cup point of view like mbappe almost injured in training it's kind of a low key enough uh, build up like pierre luigi colina has said assistant referees keep your flag down for tight off sides and let var deal with it that's like the second biggest news line admittedly after the uh Lopetegui which is a club news. story in it, it is, is yeah, but a strange way. there's no i mean look there's never going to be a saipan but there's no big story at the moment it's it, it's like everything's taken along quite nicely i think we're everyone. waiting for the football to kick off yeah I mean, obviously there's updates on salah and will he be back for not for, you know egypt's opening game which is on friday mm. um but yeah the abape injury scare um, you know the the Egyptian, the forty five year old Egyptian goalkeeper. Yeah. Like there's more colour pieces. Even the England camp, as I said, they've played it quite well. There's no big English scandal hanging over this tournament. It's it's open stories, learning about the players and and the personalities. Yeah. I mean, maybe when I mean, Russia Saudi Arabia is not a huge opening game, yeah. and the the host country's story isn't really alluring in in such a way that the you know I remember in South Africa in two thousand and ten, the, like the emotion of the the opening ceremony and the opening game was unbelievable like mm. something I, I wasn't even at that game i was watching it in cape town and even like just people in the lobby of a hotel like the staff almost in tears when the anthem was being played that's something i'll remember right um you don't have that same feeling around this opening game this time around not to say that there won't be emotion and 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 life around it but it sort of feels like we're waiting for the football to get there to bring us there yeah it does a bit so um with that in mind we're going to check in with graham hunter i think where we'll all really get excited will be of course uh, russia saudi arabia will will have its own certain geopolitical charm mm. but uh, spain portugal is on friday we were going to talk to graham hunter anyway today about that and uh, then the uh, news broke about the Spanish manager. So we'll go over to Graeme and hear the reaction in the Spanish camp next. Football on Off The Ball. In association with the faster than ever Boyle Sports app for exclusive price enhancements on the biggest games around. Download it now. Boyle Sports, time to play. Men's health ambassadors, uh, rugby pundit Brent Pope and ex Clare hurler James e. O'Connor. Uh, he's on the line. Brent is with me in studio. Good morning, men. Good morning. Good morning, Pat. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm shocked to learn that uh, we men live four and a half years shorter than the women do. Any explanation for that, Jamesy? Hear the full Pat Kenny Show podcast at Newstalk.com and on the Newstalk app. I've been head of security for my family, must be what? 35 years? Dog years, yeah. I deal with all the major threats, loud noises, postmen, huh? squirrels. It's fine. AA Home Insurance takes care of the rest, house and contents, but that's just a backup. I've totally got this. I've got a nose for trouble. And bacon. Did you know with AA Home Insurance you can claim up to €3,000 without losing your no-claims discount? Go to the aa.ie and get €60 Euro off today. Who's got clever home insurance? Minimum premium of €218. Euro. Covers one claim in any consecutive three-year period of insurance. Acceptance criteria, terms and conditions apply. AA Ireland Limited Trading as AA Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Hi, I'm Ray Houghton. 30 years ago, I put the ball on the back of the English net when we beat England in Stuttgart at Euro 88. Inside today's Irish Independent, in a special magazine, relive the best moments from Ireland's first major tournament as we reprint the newspaper coverage from that memorable game. The Irish Independent... Sports writing in a league of its own. At Appliances Delivered, we'd like to say thanks for making us Ireland's highest rated electrical retailer on Trustpilot. Five stars. And we still have the lowest prices in Ireland guaranteed. Like some competitors, but we offer more. Next day delivery nationwide. Choose your own delivery date. Free removal of your old appliance and a team of customer service specialists. But we couldn't do any of it without you. So thanks from AppliancesDelivered.ie. Ireland's highest rated electrical retailer. Get €2,500 off a new Fiat Tipo and a diesel for the same price as a petrol from just €17,995. That saving will get you a pram that sings lullabies, a crib with its own en suite, and a bottle of champagne to drink the day they leave home. The new Fiat Tipo from €17,995 plus up to €2,500 off and a diesel petrol price match. Visit your local dealer or go to fiat.ie. Applies to vehicles registered before 31st of July 2018. Price excludes delivery and related charges. T's and C's apply. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Mm. 
That can only mean one thing. Graham Hunter is, uh, well, as he has been for the last number of years, uh, very much ensconced with the Spanish camp, and uh, he's there now. And the, well, we're going to check in with Graham anyway, as I said before the ad break, because it's Spain against Portugal on a Friday, which is definitely one of the more appetizing games of the opening weekend and the group stages generally. But then, uh, earlier on today, the big news broke that Julian uh, Lopetegui is going to leave his post as Spanish manager when the World Cup is done and become Real Madrid manager. Uh, he was never talked about at all. Uh, we knew nothing about this. And, uh, Graeme, it doesn't seem like anybody in the Spanish camp knew anything, anything about this either. Nobody did, Joe. I, I, I've interviewed uh, Lopetegui this tournament a couple of days ago. And um, I, because I muck around a little bit in interviews to try and get people to loosen up a little bit, I reminded them of a conversation we had in Seville um, after that nil-nil draw with Manchester United at the Nervion in the Champions League this season. We were at the bar, a couple of chums, Sid Lowe, myself, and Sid and I had worked on a TV station years ago when Julian Lopetegui was an, an, a TV analyst. Um, famous in Spain, actually, for once being on live TV analysis and feeling unwell, and keeping on going until he fainted and passed out. But he'd worked on TV with us, and therefore he kind of knew me a little bit, and you Sid more because um, Sid lives in Madrid. And um, as Lopetegui walked up to us after the Sevilla game, he said, um, uh, hi, lads, whatever, and Sid's like, listen, boss, boss, I've got bad news for you. He points to me and says, this guy's going to be your, your reporter in, in the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Lopetegui goes, well, so? He says, well, don't go out in the town with Graham. Do not go out in the town mm -hmm. with Graham. Uh, he likes to stay out late and sing karaoke. And he just, Lopetegui drew himself to his full height and went, I'm the karaoke king. <laughs> so in a couple of days ago, I, I reminded him of this and said, listen, you, you challenged me. You, you owe me a big sing-off, man. And he said, um, he said, don't worry, I've got a big surprise for you. Now, I took that to mean that, that we were actually going to get our session in. I didn't take it to mean that a couple of days before a meeting of the European champions and their Iberian cousins in Sochi, in Vladimir Putin's playground, it would be overshadowed by the fact that he's become the new Real Madrid manager. So, poor oh man. This, this story, I hate to disagree with you, this, this story will run and run and overshadow the game for more than a few hours, Joe. Mm. Can I get down to brass tacks here? How highly, rated, yeah. how, how highly rated is this guy as a manager? Because I look at his CV and I don't know is the honest answer. Well, um, again, just by good luck today, I was I'm interviewing De Gea, and De Gea is one of those guys who won the under-21 European Championship under Lopetegui's instructions. And I'm, just by fluke, my question was, tell me about him. And he said, look, he's a guy who we like playing for because he, he wants the ball. He wants us to dominate the ball. And when we lose it, he wants us to press and, and rob it back quickly. We like that. And I was asking him why... For example, Spain have been playing their best football for a long, long time in the, you know, nearly two years since uh, Lopetegui took over, during mm. which time they've been unbeaten. Yeah. Um, but s m more than simply racking up big goals against Liechtenstein or whatever, you know, they've played decent matches. They've played decent opposition. They've won in France. They knocked Italy out of the World Cup. They came back from 2-0 down with about 10 seconds left and drew against England, blah, blah, blah. And that feeling that the, that the key players, everybody, but the key players, particularly Busquets and Iniesta, have enjoyed themselves for Spain more than at any time since probably Euro 2012, is down to Lopetegui. Mm. And if you look at his CV and say, the only thing that counts is trophies, then you might not see what the hair was talking about, which was, again, for example, this guy was really clear communication skills. He gets his message across. So, um, if you watch the, the group that won the European under-21s, um, which was Koke, um, all right, Morata didn't make it here, Thiago, uh, Nacho, Carvajal, De Gea, these guys have graduated through and punched their weight. You know, sometimes on this programme, whichever nationality you and I have been talking about, Joe, we, we ask about golden generations who, whether they've really punched their weight in terms of performance, trophies, maturity, and, and, and that generation, including Koke, did. And Lopetegui was a really big part of their coming of age mm -hmm. and their maturity. And he's a tough guy. He likes discipline. He likes hard work. Right. He likes uh, victories. He looks the part. I mean, he was, for you, for most people in, in that part of Europe, he's a pretty low-profile footballing career, and he had no great luck. He played for Barcelona. 
played for Real Madrid, his Barcelona moments were often, he was signed by Johan Cruyff and he played under Sir Bobby Robson, but in games where often it, it was striking, it was as if he picked up um, a black cat, hurled it by the tail, hmm. smashed up a thousand mirrors in a factory on Friday the 13th and then walked under a ladder because there was always a sending off or an injury or a defeat by five goals to Atletico Madrid while he was at Barcelona. He played once for Real Madrid, but he was a good enough goalkeeper, um, particularly with Logroñas, to go to the World Cup in 1994. And he was telling us the other day that even though he was third keeper in that, it was the experience of his life. Mm. Um, he absolutely adored it, national team, World Cup. So for him to not only be willing to abandon Spain, yes, but be willing to make this announcement now, which obviously Real Madrid wanted and needed, put the story to bed, we've replaced Zidane, the right guy's in charge, we'll, we can make buying and selling decisions. You absolutely see Real Madrid's need to announce it today. It's not good for Spain that it's announced today, I don't think. So, And sorry to interrupt, were Frame, the, were, the, were, the, were the players and the Spanish Federation expecting Lopetegui to continue past this World Cup? Are you kidding? Yeah. Right. This, this is a guy who, in theory, in terms of contract, in terms of his relationship with the new president, Rubiales, um... This is a guy whose energy, age, attitude, um, the fact that he's been you know, through the, the Spain nursery teams, his relationship so far as we've seen with the players. You know, if you stood back and look at the photo fit, he was meant to be here for probably four or six years. Okay. Very interesting times. Hey, um, so you've been around these Spanish camps now in your role with UEFA and doing interviews with them for... Uh, several tournaments now, so I'm wondering how the general atmosphere compares with previous tournaments. What are we getting from the 2018 version? Because even people may be surprised to see that even just from Euro 2016, only 10 of the 23 have survived. So this, this in, in a large part, is a different bunch to the groups you would have followed in uh, particularly those golden championship winning years. When you don't have Puyol or Chabi or Alonso or Cap de Vila, a favourite of mine, or Marchena, Iker, you notice the change in atmosphere, you notice the change in personalities. It's a slightly, slightly quieter bunch. It's a slightly younger bunch than, than when they were winning, say, 2012 or 2010. But the atmosphere is, is noticeably different from both Brazil and France. This, that, uh, this news about Lopetegui is something that we'll have to assimilate. It was yeah. only you know, a couple of hours ago that it came out and we have yet to be back with the players again. But the but the day-to-day -day atmosphere here so far has reflected what I was trying to get across about their playing style since being beaten by Italy in Paris and being turfed out of the European Championships. So it's, there's a bunch that really likes working together. There's a bunch where you can see their intensity. In, in France, there was a, a, an end of era feeling. Yeah. Fin de siècle. Uh, the, the Bosque, fabulous man though he is, high achiever though he was, had stayed on at least one tournament too many. And just that fraying at the edges was beginning to eat into the, the intensity. Now, that's here, and it'll need to be here because the dip in terms of sharpness that the Spain players had at the end of the domestic season, they've had a little rest and they, they don't look bang, bang on it right now. Mm. But with each passing day, they have looked more so. And the work is right. The passing and the shooting and the attitudes, these things are right. They just look as if a tiny bit of edge was taken off because they had a break. And, and the majority of the players I'm here watching in Krasnodar Academy in 84 degree heat, beautiful stadium, facilities you wouldn't believe, Joe. I mean, I've traveled the world and in any sport, it's, these are the best facilities I've ever witnessed. It's, yeah. it's extraordinary. And Galitsky, the billionaire owner of the club, took Tim uh, Manson, my cameraman, myself and our assistant producer around the stadium, taking us by the arm and hauling us into the the gym or his private box or, come and let me show you the worst seat in the house. And of hmm. course, the worst seat in the house is utterly brilliant. So they're working in good conditions. They're working with the right attitudes. They're just um, sharpening up as they needed to because the break just took an edge off them. Yeah. And they're looking as if it might have been better if the Portugal game was coming second or third in the group. Mm. And I think that they've got a test, a really, really big test. And yeah. I wouldn't argue if somebody said to me, I think Portugal start favourites for this, okay. certainly the first game. Um, but they're going to be ready. They're going to get out of the group. 
And that's the stage we all know where momentum and a player coming through, yeah. a player or two comes through. If that player is Asensio and Aspas uh, and, and comes through in, in game two, game three, game four, Spain have got at least an argument about going far. Uh, it's a treacherous group. And the attitude here that I can tell you is the attitude here is win the first game. I don't yeah. think they're outstanding favourites to do so, but everything is built towards going out and not looking for a draw, looking to beat Portugal, knock over the European champions. And that, that, that's why you're right. It is an interesting first round match. Yeah, very interesting. So it's Spain, Portugal, uh, Sochi on Friday, then they have Iran on uh, Wednesday, and then it's Morocco on the 25th on a Monday as their final game. And um, they will be pitted against one of Russia, Saudi Arabia, Uruguay, or Egypt. It's uh, Group B versus Group A. Hey, um, just a, a very quick one, because I've one other uh, broader question to ask you. I know, I think it was South Africa, certainly, that um, they stayed in very kind of sparse, it was like a university type uh, digs accommodation, it wasn't five star hotels for the players, you mentioned the lovely training facilities, what about their uh, five star hotel or is it a five star hotel back at base? <laughs> it's, it's uh, um, everything is encased, so the stadium the, I don't know 15, 16 pitches the gymnasium, the restaurant and the hotel are all on the same Krasnodar FC campus so you walk in, it's, it's extraordinary security I mean, genuinely extraordinary. But you walk in and your whole if you're a Spain player, your whole world is there. So one of the differences from South Africa is they're not going to be permitted to wander off downtown as Iniesta did and Fernando Torres did in Poch of Strum in South Africa. And you're right, it was very postgrad student accommodation in Poch. It, it, everything worked, but, you know, there was a, a two-bar fire, a television which was the size of a small iPad, and, and these rooms are different. These rooms are um, they're, they're plush. They're very like the the national team hotel on the training campus in Madrid. Um, okay. They're pleasant. They're not spacious, but they function. Um, Spain are going to feel that they're in a proper working atmosphere. But then we'll travel um, all over Sochi, Kaliningrad, and Kazan, and they stay in in six star hotels. They do yeah. and. Yours truly will be <clears throat> lucky enough to share that for a day, and Joe, <laughs> I'm worth it. Oh, listen, baby, you're worth it. I think <laughs> yeah, I, I want you in the presidential suite. Um, so I guess the other question I sort of have, I'm looking at the squad, and again, like the names jump out pretty clearly. So, I mean, uh, De Gea, Carvajal, Ramos, Pique, and Alba kind of picks itself in, in my mind, I presume. And yeah. then Busquets and Iniesta are in. Uh, after that discuss, what are, what are we going to see in the main? Or, or does um, Lopetegui have question marks over what his best 11 is coming into this tournament? I think the question marks were rattled away by Tunisia. The changes at halftime mean that I think Carvajal won't quite make the first game, although he trained today, this morning. So he's probably going to be available for game two, I think. And, and that means natural for Carvajal until, you know, because of the Salah impact. Yeah. So few people seem to remember Danny Carvajal being carried off the pitch in Kiev, sobbing in tears. Yeah. So he's nearly back, um, but you, your back, four is, back five is right. Um, fit, it's Iniesta Busquets Koki. I think Koki will definitely edge it over Thiago in this game. Mm -hmm. Up front, again, um, all being well, it'll be Isco um, and David Silva. And in my opinion, probably Rodrigo will start. Um, but it's firmly my opinion that Spain and excuse the expression, are a 14-man team. Mm. Because I think we will see a lot of Asensio. I think we'll see a lot of Aspas. And I think we'll see quite a lot of Lucas. And I think that there are game winners on the bench. And I think that tournament play means that timing is everything and players will emerge. And Asensio's ability to shoot from distance, um, his magical technical skills, Aspas's ability to conjure up uh, solutions to, to trick players um, and his goal record, his two best seasons. That's a nice thing to be able to say to you. Again, Rodrigo's had the best season of his life in terms of scoring. Yeah. Aspas has just had the best two seasons of his life in terms of scoring. I, I think, I genuinely believe we're going to see action from these guys. And I think that guys like them will determine whether Spain goes through the group, whether they go first or second, and whether they're able to beat their first round opponents, which I hope will be as group winners in Moscow playing one of the two teams you talked about. And hey, just imagine if it was <clears throat> Spain against Egypt and 
Salah against Ramos. Do you think the world could stand round two of that? <laughs> yes, I think we could. Actually, we'll play out Ramos's World Cup song in just a moment. Um, Please don't. No, I'm, I'm hearing bad things. So, um, right, this is probably the last time I'll get to talk to you where you're not running for a train and you're so crystal clear <laughs> and like it's the calm before the storm. So, uh, allow me to just ask you that broader question. Uh, Spain aside, what's your reading of this tournament? It feels quite open in comparison with previous years. Couldn't agree more. I, mean, I think there's two outstanding favourites. And there are really good reasons for them, and it's not because of what their names sound like. I think Brazil and Germany have a depth of talent and an attitude and a sense of timing that leave them in a group of two. Um, I think both of the, both of their sets of players is used to traipsing across a big nation and and being together and producing at the right time. You set aside the the you know Brazil's uh, Germany's performance against Brazil last time, and things have changed under TC. There's yeah. no question that yeah. Brazil are a different mob. After that, then there's an argument for Uruguay, there's an argument for Belgium, there's an argument for France, blah, 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 blah. I'd love to see Spain win it again. But if you look back at their tournaments, they've had a lot of luck about location and lack of travel in each of the ones that they won. And they had Villa and Xavi. And I'm not sure that we can say the equivalent now. Mm. So much though I'd like to say this is a winning side, I have my slight reservations. And... Much though it's um, a combination of romanticism and um, instinct, I, 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 I've begun to think that the best dark horse is Argentina. I've begun to think that although Lancini's injury is a, is a, is a real, real problem and a real mm. footballing disaster, Sampaoli has known how to get a, a team playing in, in, a, in a cup format playing for Messi. He's yeah. the first coach Messi's had that says, not only do I know what I want to do, I know how to do it. So if Aguero gets fit and Di Maria has a tournament and they sort out the goalkeeping worries, then I can see Argentina legitimately being good dark horses, <laughs> equally a team that could go out in the group stage. But I do think that with momentum, there's enough around Messi to do some of the work for him that will make the hair's breadth difference from the two Copa America finals and the World Cup final lost, mm, I think. Mm, mm. And nothing, uh, there's no point in me lying on a show that you know knows me well for the last 17 years. Nothing in this tournament would me, give me greater pleasure than seeing Leo Messi lifting the World Cup with one hand and, and sticking his middle finger up to his critics with the other yeah. in Moscow and July the 15th. Yeah, it'd feel pretty fitting. Uh, very, very last question. Answer as short as you want, because um, I presume you're very busy. I should have asked this at the outset. On uh, Lopetegui getting the job at Real Madrid, like, are you surprised? Like, does it make sense that Madrid have gone for this guy, or is this a massive gamble on their part? I am surprised. Um, it came as a shock. Um, I, I can understand it because of what kind of person he is, but the Real Madrid, Madrid job is one that devours you mm. and it's one whereby um, Zidane has left a pretty difficult task and I think if it were me I'd have been shrewd and said uh, I need double Zidane's salary or treble Zidane's salary if you want me and they would say no and you'd say okay we'll talk again in two or three years um, because the expectations coming in now uh, are pretty astonishing. He has to improve their domestic performance vastly because of the point gaps between points gap between them and the champions. And somehow or other, he has to do a facsimile job mm. of dominating Europe again. Yeah, that's a big ask. Yeah, it and sure is. I was waiting for an, a, a coach who was in a position where he needed this job and was willing to accept the tough nature of it, whereas Lopetegui was sitting with a very good crop of Spain players with probably a couple of tournaments to to give him a, a bigger reputation. Yeah. And, and therefore, I admire him for taking the risk, but yes, to me, it is something of a surprise, Joe. Yeah, okay, you've summed that up very nicely. Hey, um, so listen, it's the start of one of these adventures, and I appreciate you giving us 20 minutes when I can only imagine how busy you are. <laughs> so, um, look, have a great time. Send me pictures of you in your bathrobe in the presidential suite <laughs> from six, uh, six Star Hotels. Make sure the bathrobe is on, and uh, I guess we'll see you over the next while. That's one of the most interesting farewells I've ever been given <laughs> in the show, and I really enjoyed it. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.
the ball on News Talk. Discover something new for 182. Discover Hyundai's exclusive range of 182 offers. Choose from five years free servicing, 3.9% APR finance, or scrappage of up to 